Welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Wolf Ditkoff. I'm a senior advisor at the Bridgebank Group. And I understand we're welcoming people from 16 different countries, uh, time zones today. So welcome to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, today, we are so lucky to talk with two inspiring and experienced leaders about building a new blueprint, how we can end Jewish poverty. Our discussion will be led by Rachel Monroe, president and CEO of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation, and Arielle Zwang, the new CEO of JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee. We wanted to launch our session uh, by understanding you, uh, what's important to you, uh, and what your ideas are. So our first question is gonna be a poll, which should come up um, on your screen pretty shortly. Um, and the question is going to be, of your overall funding portfolio, what percentage of your organizations or your own giving is focused on poverty alleviation? So that should be coming up in a moment. While we are waiting for it, I will also sort of name the next question. Oh, here we go. Okay, the poll is in progress. Of your funding portfolio, what percentage of your organizations or your own giving is focused on poverty alleviation? In the meantime, while people are finishing, I will give you the second question, and this is for the chat. Um, some of you may have heard the phrase, first, why? So once you've answered the poll, we invite you to share your why with your colleagues. Um, why is poverty alleviation an important area in your giving? And if it's not, if you'd be willing to share why, um, we encourage you to be as open as you can, as you feel comfortable being. Um, our speakers will be quite open in a few minutes, um, but it'll just help sort of calibrate the conversation. Decisions are made for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so we do expect a whole wide variety of answers. Uh, there's no right answer or wrong answer. Uh, we'll wait for a couple more things to come into the poll and if folks could start to answer some questions in the chat about why poverty alleviation is important and if not, any reasons why it's not. All right, most of the people have voted in the poll so I'm gonna end the poll and we'll take a look at it. Overwhelmingly, if you can see, um, about 42% are in the 50 to 75% range, which is quite high. Um, a, a group that's quite committed in this area, which is terrific. Um, and a pretty even distribution across the rest. Um, certainly 40% below 50, you know, below the halfway mark um, and definitely some at the top as well. So thank you for that. Um, that's helpful. And thank you for starting to add in thoughts to the chat. Um, are we uh, differentiating between Jewish or general poverty? I think just, just let us know. Uh, some people, it's two different program areas and some people have their Jewish and their um, general community poverty um, entwined in one area. So we'd love to hear that. So answers will continue to come in. And I do want to encourage you to use the chat today. Um, at questions, thoughts as they arise, um, it really will make this much more interactive and it will help Rachel and Ariel make sure that they address the questions that are in your mind. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Rachel. Um, the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation is one of the 50 largest foundations in the country. And while Rachel's portfolio is roughly $125 million in the US and Israel, across the Jewish and non-Jewish community, Rachel is also very interested in the impact of smaller strategic grants. And we'll be talking about that as well. Um, Rachel's the co-founder of the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty, uh, which is designed to bring together funders and uh, federations, agencies, nonprofits, uh, media, communities, really everyone who is working to end poverty in the Jewish community. Um, Rachel also has experience in the private sector um, as a worldwide marketing director for an architecture firm, um, numerous roles in public-private partnerships with government, so we'll, we'll talk about that. And we're just very fortunate that Rachel will be in dialogue with Ariel, uh, who Rachel will introduce in a moment. Um, both of them are incredible women who are multi-sector championship players, um, and, and we need that sort of cross-sector thinking, and we'll, we'll talk about that now more than ever. So finally, I do want to acknowledge that we are three white presenting women on this panel. Um, given the gender balance of CEOs in the sector, it really is terrific to have these two accomplished CEOs uh, leading this conversation. 
Uh, I'm also mindful, we're all mindful, that we do not have any leaders of color on this panel, although both Rachel and Ariel will speak to racial equity in their work. So uh, while we do know that wealth is not equally distributed, we also know that both of these women are really thoughtful about how to extend and distribute power beyond the walls of their institutions. So we are looking forward to the conversation. And with that, let me turn this over to Rachel to get us started. Susan, thank you very much. Hope everyone can hear me. Hope you're doing well. Hope you've enjoyed the JFM conference so far and navigated the technology without too much frustration. I want to acknowledge Gina from JFN, who's with us, who's been leading the Jewish National Poverty Affinity Group work. Thanks, Susan, for her friendship professionally and personally and her commitment to this session. And also recognize Rafi Rohn from Weinberg, who is on the screen right now. I don't think other colleagues are here. Uh, one of our close colleagues who many of you know, John Hornstein, unfortunately, is attending the funeral of a family relative, so could not be with us. Um, so with that, I really want to move us to hearing from Ariel, who um, I'm sure was the draw for so many of you today to hear from her, to learn from her, and to meet the extraordinary woman who is now the professional leader of JDC. So uh, Ariel began her role as CEO of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, or JDC, or the Joint, pick your language, in January. Uh, she's been the CEO of Distinguished Nonprofit Organizations for more than 20 years. She previously comes from Safe Horizon, which is an, a leading American social service agency. It ha she had a staff of a thousand, a budget over $100 million, and impacted more than a quarter of a million people a year. Her work really focused on victims of violence and abuse, including those who have the very least, including homeless youth. Full disclosure, Safe Horizon is actively a Weinberg Foundation grantee. Ariel has also served in government roles. She was a White House fellow. She was special assistant to the chancellor of the New York City Board of Education. And she began her career as I did in the private sector with Morgan Stanley and Boston Consulting Group. She is a passionate, lifelong, deeply engaged member of the Jewish community. She served in numerous leadership positions, including at her synagogue in UJA, New York. She is the proud parent of two young adult daughters who are both Jewish day school and Jewish camping kids. She holds an MBA and a BA from Harvard. Um, and I wanna tell you a few other things that are not in the bio that you read about Ariel online. I find her to be both very strong and compassionate at the same time. I find her to be a very serious, active listener and learner. Unlike me, who is terrible at this, she is an avid knitter, which she has done since she was a teenager. She's a walker and a biker, and she will beat any of you in trivia related to Central Park, including you, Rafi. She is a serious Sudoku puzzle player, which I am not. But we do have a few things in common. We've both been married to our spouses for 25 years. We both went to Camp Ramah in New England, go Palmer. And we both love James Taylor and Jane Eyre. So those are some things about Ariel to get us started. But to, to really have you answer the first question, Ariel, the question is likely what everyone wonders and wants to know why did you want this job? What made you decide to say yes when so many people are exhausted in the social service sector? You are really doubling down after two executive roles with major nonprofits focused on poverty alleviation. Tell us why you said yes and why you wanted to do this. Well, I will tell you in a minute, Rachel, but first I have to say thank you. Thank you for your very kind words, Susan, also for your welcome and to you both for your leadership in the field and your very warm welcome. Um, I also want to, uh, if I can, just acknowledge uh, our board president, Mark Sisiski, um, who's with us and, um, and, and, and it's, it's a joy to be able to say what drew me to JDC because actually it dovetails perfectly with the topic of this session, which is effective philanthropy for those and assisting those who live in poverty and what can be learned um, you know, from the international experience. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the work of the joint of JDC. And you know that we um, work with you know, the tens of thousands of poor Jews in the former Soviet Union and all over the world. But what I'm going to tell you about briefly is the combination that JDC has of providing direct support and also supporting community resiliency. And that is an, a, a, a 
tremendously powerful part of the way JDC works and one of the real reasons that I was extraordinarily attracted to the work. For example, uh, we provide direct support, um, especially to elders in the FSU. Now, some people may look at this and say, uh, how does that really alleviate poverty? After all, people are still poor after you're providing these direct supports. But in the former Soviet Union, we have extended the lifespan of people under our care in some cases beyond eight years beyond the typical lifespan in the countries that they live in. So very, very directly prolonging people's lives, extending them and the quality of their life is something that JDC does incredibly competently. Um, and I think again, um, you know, is an important philanthropic lesson as well. And then the other thing is about supporting community resiliency. In 2001, JDC partnered with the Jewish community in Argentina during their economic collapse. Yes, of course, JDC provided direct aid to Jews thrust into poverty, just, you know, as, as, as any compassionate response would be, but also provided job training, new skill building for the unemployed, helped to build and strengthen Jewish social service infrastructure to handle Jewish poverty in the long term. And that's something that we do all over the world as well. And so after recovery, those programs and organizations largely became self-sufficient. When again, Argentina's financial crisis of the last few years was worsened by COVID-19, those institutions were there and JDC was there. And again, that speaks to staying power, um, that interventions, anti-poverty interventions um, that have staying power are also there. Um, uh, they, they may not be as needed immediately in years that are good, um, but in years that are bad, um, it doesn't take a whole ramp up to be there. So I am just immensely drawn to and proud of the work of JDC. And again, specifically related to our topic today, those, those are some of the most powerful reasons why. Thank you. Um, Ariel, from the conversations you and I have had together, I've learned a lot about your extensive and meaningful family Jewish journey. And I want to pause for a minute with another woman on the screen who has a very meaningful and extensive Jewish journey, and that is the Weinberg Foundation Chair, Ambassador Faye hartug -Levin. If you haven't seen her on the screen, she is with us today, which is very kind. Thank you for being here, Faye. Um, so Ariel, can you share a little bit with us about your family's narrative and what impact it has had on you in terms of wanting and accepting this job and how that translates to the work at JDC for you? Sure. Well, I, um, Rachel, as you pointed out, we both went to Camp Ramon, Um, and I'll take you even farther back than that, though, than, than my childhood, which is to my grandparents' childhood. And around the time that JDC was being founded, and we we're 107 years old, my grandparents were coming over in steerage um, from, uh, from Eastern Europe, saying goodbye to their loved ones, um, knowing they would never see them again and doing all of that so that I could lead the life that I do lead. So that 50 or 60 years later, well, I would be born and 20 years after that, I would graduate from college and then I would be able to do anything that I wanted. And because I had been so fortunate, um, the career choices that I made in my late twenties related to helping others to access all the things that people deserve and need in life. Um, basic human dignity of a, a job that can support your family and an education that can enable that and a decent place to live. And I've, um, I've been doing that work um, since 1992 for about um, almost 30 years. Over the course of that time, other things happened. I became a mother. I became an adult, a more of an adult. I mean, I was in my 20s at the time. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I had a bigger view of the world as well. And I thought about, you know, my own vibrant Jewish journey. Uh, when my grandparents came here, one grandfather was a kosher butcher in Newark. Uh, the other grandfather was a conservative rabbi. My grandmothers had their careers uh, also in concert with my grandfather's. Uh, my dad was a, a, a Salma Schechter principal, so I'm the product of day school. Camp Rama, you know, children also day school and, and Jewish camping. And 
when I thought about this juncture for me, there's so many important things in the world that call to me and that seem very, very pressing to me in ways that are much more powerful than they were 30 years ago when I was making my initial decisions. The idea that my children can grow up with a vibrant Jewish life, free to practice their religion and express themselves Jewishly, and that all over the former Soviet Union, by an forces of history, kids their age are denied that is tragic to me. And so knowing at JDC that we run the largest um, Jewish youth program in the former Soviet Union, active Jewish teens, is incredibly meaningful to me. Uh, the anti-poverty work that I've been doing my whole life, and I see my colleague Sigal Shelach here who runs our programs in Israel, is the same mission that we have in Israel, where um, uh, the levels of income disparity uh, in Israel are similar to the United States, very significant in the, in the developed world, unfortunately. And JDC is working to level the playing field in society for the disabled, for the elderly, workforce development in ways in the Haredi community, in the Arab community, all in ways that speak to me very directly, um, uh, given, given what I've done uh, my whole career. So, you know, those are just a couple of the things that, um, that, that call to me and drew me as someone that has, you know, led a Jewish life entirely since birth. Um, and now I'm able to marry that and it feels like a great privilege um, with, with anti-poverty work and Jewish communal development work um, that's, that's very, very much aligned with what's important to me. I would imagine many of us on this call have similar feelings and similar experiences that blend together in the work that we do. Um, so I wanna ask a question about sort of there's a renewed focus today on bringing people with lived experience into the center of conversations, not as a quick technical fix, but as a meaningful approach and as a way to adapt our work to have whomever is receiving the services at the core of the solution, at the core of the conversation. Uh, it's quite challenging for us to do in a lot of the nonprofit spaces where we all work focused on poverty and how we engage in those conversations. So I thought you could share a little bit about uh, examples in your previous work that you bring to JDC, where you've worked with uh, the most vulnerable and most marginalized populations and putting them at the center of the work. Well, as you say, Rachel, you know, I've, I've been at JDC uh, about two and a half months, um, but I was at Safe Horizon for 12 and a half years. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give an analogy here that draws from my work at, at, at Safe Horizon. Putting marginalized communities in the center is starts off feeling straightforward. And as you truly commit to it, becomes in some cases very hard. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Safe Horizon embarked on um, a racial equity process. It wasn't a diversity and inclusion process, it was a racial equity process and centered race in America. Well, we, we, our work is in America at, at Safe Horizon. And, um, and at Safe Horizon, about 80% of the uh, professionals are people of color and about 80% of the clients are people of color. So um, the organization is set up like any other large human service nonprofit, which is to say, um, not along necessarily straightforward principles of racial equity. And what was hard for me, and, and, and I, you know, I was engaged in this for about seven years until I left. So each year was deeper and more of a journey than the last. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. You know, I went into the work, listen, I've been doing this work for 30 years. My perspective is I'm here to help. I love all and respect all. And, you know, I don't really see myself as someone that's racist. And of course, what I learned is that it's, it's not about my own feelings or how I think about myself, but about systems and structures in society that I can have a role to push back against. So I'll give you an example. 
Rachel, you mentioned I have an MBA. I had been working for decades and I knew of, of two reasons that you would give someone a raise. A, promotion or performance. B, some sort of market adjustment. So the market affects how much you earn. And, and after really listening to our staff, I learned a third reason to give raises, which is equity. That too many, and, and again, in the human service sphere and in the anti-poverty sphere, where I know many people are funding, the staff is not very different from the clients in terms of their socioeconomic status. And so we began gave, giving raises at, at Safe Horizon. We, we did a, um, a, a kind of couple of rounds of them that were strictly based on the fact that it was wrong for people to earn so little. And I remember a board member saying, well, that's great that you're doing that and that's good, um, but isn't there a merit component to it? And, you know, I mean, for the first time in my life, I just said, no, it's not about that. And I use that, I offer that example for the very reason that seven years before when we embarked on that anti-racism work, if you had asked me if I would be behind raises that were just equity based, I would have said, I, I, you know, I can't, just can't imagine that. Um, but after years of study and really listening, um, you know, it allowed me to think thoughts that I hadn't thought before. So, you know, this idea of listening to communities and what they need, also it relates to ideas of community resiliency as well, which I, I spoke about before. It's hubristic of CEOs, funders, all of us, um, to say only we know best. Um, and we have to learn to say, maybe I don't know best. And so those are, those are some thoughts, but Rachel, how does this, I mean, how's your work centered this as well? You know, I think the, the most emotional example for me was uh, in the aftermath of the killing of Freddie Gray in Baltimore in April of 2015. Um, and the painful reaction in this city. And at the time, the mayor um, and the subsequent mayor uh, invited me to attend meetings that took place in City Hall with 20 to 30 men and women, um, mostly formerly incarcerated who were working in very small ways in Baltimore City on the corner of the street that they cared about literally to try to make a difference. And I'll, I remember going down to the first meeting I went to, it was seven o'clock in the morning. I was exhausted candidly and saying to myself, what am I doing here? Um, P.S. I didn't leave until 1030 in the morning. I missed three meetings and got in lots of trouble for it. But I heard the raw voices of men and women living through the experience in their communities of the killing of Freddie Gray not how I lived through it, which was very different. Um, and what I also learned was Weinberg was missing from that table and we were not accessible as a grantee to these very, very, very small entities. That resulted in a partnership with Baltimore City and the mayor's office, whoever the mayor is is irrelevant, but through City Hall in grants that are a maximum of $10,000 that have a much lower threshold for funding uh, in partnership with City Hall. and. We've given $514,000 since that meeting. The average grant is just under $7,000. My favorite example is a program called Bedtime in a Box. I don't know if anyone's heard of this program. When it started, they served 600 families. They've currently served more than 10,800 families. The box includes five age appropriate books and pajamas and a washcloth and a towel and a stuffed animal and an alarm clock and toothbrush and toothpaste. and and on and on and on. Um, and you know that's the example of improving someone's life in the moment with kids are going to bed really traumatized from something happening in the community and trying to give them a sense of routine and a sense of calm wrapped around that moment. Um, and I won't go on, but we have changed the way that we have worked and we have changed the way that we have funded when we have learned from the community what we are not doing and should potentially be doing. And for me, that's been really powerful. Um, I, and I do think that small grants can be the seeds of very large organizations. Many of us on this call are part of foundations that funded Leading Edge early when it was small and you see what it's doing now. 
Uh, for us, the first grant to Jews of color and Alana Kaufman was a very small grant, uh, less than $30,000. And um, now it is an important, important grant for the foundation. I don't know if you guys saw, Alana did a survey of Jews of color around the country, more than a thousand responses. Um, and, you know, we also have pushed, we're pushing the Federation world with love and respect to the, those of you on the call from Federations. I hope you'll encourage your Federation to participate through JFNA. Weinberg is giving money to increase and supplement any demographic study of a community to ask questions about Jews of color that are statistically the same question so that we can have collective and comparative national data, perhaps for the first time. Um, and we're also working with Yavila McCoy at Dimensions, who's extraordinary uh, to lead the foundation's equity, uh, racial equity initiative work. So all of this for us started really in earnest in 2015 at that very early morning meeting when I was very tired. Um, so moving on, um, Ariel, is there anything you want to talk about regarding racial equity work at JDC before we pass it back to Susan to moderate some Q&A? Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, there's some noise outside. I would just add that, um, you know, um, this is an area in which our young people are also leading the way. And just as um, uh, we can believe that we want to, you know, um, uh, and, and truly want to listen to communities that we serve. I think we also can truly want to listen to the young. I'll speak as the mother of, of the young, and it can be hard. Um, but the fact is that um, our Entwine group, which um, is focused on engaging um, younger people in the whole project of caring about the whole world and also in particular caring about the Jewish world. Of course, through JDC, but not only through JDC. Um, they are also leading our organization in, um, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And, um, and of course, that's in part because, um, because the reality, especially um, in, a, in a generation younger than mine, is, is um, such a flowering of pride in the diversity. You know, I learned actually from a Federation executive recently, I learned a new word for myself, Ashkenormative. Does everybody know that word? Ashkenormative. You know, the idea that our institutions, um, synagogues, schools, language, uh, center Ashkenazic-ness, as Jewishness. Um, and of course, we're all growing beyond that. Thank you, Ariel. Susan, I turn it back to you. Good, wow, there was so much packed into a very short 20 minutes. Um, I'll just make one observation. There are a number of questions um, or comments in the chat about the equity piece. So since we're there, we'll start there and then we'll, we'll back up to some of the systems change piece. But I thought I would just share one statistic. Um, there was an original piece of research that my colleagues at BridgeFan did with Cheryl Dorsey, who um, was a terrific partner. She's a head of Echo and Green. And what they found, and I'll just leave you with this one nugget, is that when it comes to the holy grail of financial support, which is unrestricted funding, the picture is pretty bleak in terms of racial equity and uh, organizations led by people of color. I think the, uh, the unrestricted net assets of the black led organizations in their sample um, was 76% smaller than the unrestricted net assets from their white counterparts. Um, and that's it particularly startling, not only because that's the lifeblood, but also because that funding often represents a proxy for trust um, in the philanthropic community. So anyway, just leave you with that and thinking about what does it mean to, to think about the equity across a portfolio. Um, there are a couple of comments in here about equity. And so let's start there. One is, you know, Ariel, how do you think about, um, do you have a personal equity coach um, who works with you um, and about communication? Um, and then there was a second, I'll pair that with a second question, which is, um, are there other ways to think about this as well? Disability was raised. 
um, living wage was raised. So it would be great if we can sort of talk about some of those other elements of equity in addition to racial equity. Sure. Do I have a personal equity coach? Um, actually, we could take that offline if you like. I have benefited from years, years of um, direct coaching to me and also organizational coaching um, because um, related in, in that case to racial equity, um, it is something that um, a lot of equity work is based on um, on unpacking implicit bias, not to throw around so many buzzwords, but whether it is how I, how, what ideas I have about people who are disabled or people who are of a different race or people of the same race or those who I assume don't work or whatever it might be, those are in, ideas that are deep inside me that I'm not even aware of but of course, they, um, you know, uh, they, they, they motivate um, my decisions and my behavior. And the reason that um, coaching or cons consulting with those who are experts is so crucial is because it allows you to realize how your own thinking might not be the thoughts that, that you really believe if you think about it on further reflection. So um, I can't say the names because there are too many and, and I'm happy, Jennifer, if you wanted to reach out to me and I could share that. But I really do wanna put a shout out. I mean, Rachel, you mentioned that you're working with Yavila McCoy, for example, who um, I've experienced her work as well. There are many people who are uh, offering themselves uh, their expertise now and I, I, I definitely recommend that. And so I understand the um, the rest of the question to be, what about all the other isms? What about ableism? What about ageism? What about sexism? Um, yes, and we also must look at all of those things. And I think that what I would say is, um, you know, it's funny. I I'm gonna use the example of being the first woman CEO of, of JDC. Um, I'm the first woman CEO of JDC. People say, well, how does that feel to you? And um, part of how that feels to me is grateful to JDC for being the path-breaking organization that said, yeah, um, we'll hire you, Ariel. And also where I come from, I've been a CEO for 20 years. It doesn't feel new or different to me. Um, in that environment, there was you know, you're, there's there's never enough, but there was significant equity for women. Um, and the big next issue was, was race. I'm in an environment now where it's still a leading edge, you know, all of our world, the, the Jewish communal world is one where it's still a leading edge issue. And I'm appreciative of JDC for being at the leading edge of it, but we still have to focus on that. So I think, um, you know, focusing on the issues that feel urgent in your community, that feels very, very important to me. Good, and that dovetails with a couple of other thoughts in the chat, but Rachel, did you wanna say something about that before we? Yeah, I just strongly agree with this note in the chat. Um, in addition to what Ariel said, you know, we spend a lot of time, particularly in Baltimore, uh, meeting with and talking to leaders of small nonprofits, often black women from the community who are doing extraordinary work. And I learn more sitting with them once a month for two or three hours, whether we're having coffee or wine safely outside, which we have continued to do, than I do from many. Um, and the challenges that are being faced really on the ground at ground zero and trying to work on the, the, the myriad of issues someone facing poverty is navigating. So I, I just want to call out this comment and say, I agree. 
Good, that was the one I was gonna go to. So thank you for that. Um, and, and it is true as you think about the different isms, one of the other pieces that's in the chat is, uh, the, is the global piece um, and, and specifically sort of Jewish poverty in the US and Jewish poverty globally. So what's happening, um, there's a sort of a question, what's happening with new poverty in the US? Um, and so maybe you can give us a little bit of a sense of that, especially given your background, Ariel. Sure. Uh, well, I think that COVID has affected um, Jews as it has affected all human beings around the world in ways that intensify um, a disadvantage that was already there. And so um, uh, for the disabled, and, and I'm going to use Israel as the example because that's that's where we do most of our disability work, um, I, I was on I don't remember what I was. I was among, in, a, in a discussion group among people, and um, and um, and the topic was feeling isolated at home because you can't get out because you're not allowed to go out because it's a lockdown and all the things that you want to do you can't do. And in the chat, somebody said, "Welcome to what it feels like all the time to be living with a disability." So. Imagine then that you were living with a disability and now it's COVID. Um, so those who, and, and, and that's true also of people who were, left, so let's talk about the US, who were in a marginal situation economically. It's just worse. So I think, you know, part of the, the I know part of this session is about um, uh, recognizing and addressing that, um, that Jewish poverty isn't only overseas. Of course, at JDC, that's our focus. Um, but having worked with poor communities also for decades in the US, you know, part of our implicit biases are that those people aren't there, but they are, and have been further, um, you know, lost jobs, unable to pay medical expenses, choosing between food and medicine and all of that. And that's, of course, just wor worsened by the pandemic. Rachel, you've been funding in the space of both Jewish poverty and non-Jewish poverty for such a long time. What is it that you've seen particularly different about Jewish poverty now? Um, what, what I'm ha optimistic about, happy is the wrong word, but I'm optimistic about many Jewish programs looking outward for models and examples. And when I say outward, I mean sort of capital O outside of just the Jewish community. So we found in the summary of data that is available regarding Jewish poverty in the US and JFN and John Hornstein from our team put that together and Dina can get that to anyone if you don't have it. Single mothers with children in the Jewish community is a real category of poverty. And there's very few if any programs dedicated to single moms with kids in the Jewish community from Jewish nonprofits supporting them in basic core needs. There are some amazing programs in the general community helping homeless youth and helping single moms with kids who are living in poverty. And we are seeing Jewish organizations tilt towards those programs to try to adapt them for their community members. So for me, that's an important moment. Um, one of the frustrations we have is often when you ask a Jewish food program who they compare themselves to, they talk about five other Jewish pro food programs in the United States instead of five programs within a three mile radius of their location and why they're not collaborating and partnering and working together. So we've tried to catalyze some of that. But in this moment, we are seeing in the same way some Jewish foundations are funding in the space of social services and individual philanthropists, which we congratulate and are thrilled to see and hope it continues we see the Jewish nonprofits really looking more broadly at how to incorporate models. If I could just sort of add a mirror image to that. And I think that um, I agree with you, Rachel, that, um, you know, the Jewish communal world is so um, vibrant and rich in community and in institutions that um, we can sometimes um, think that we're very particular and that there isn't that much we can learn or do with secular organizations. 
And I, I would just offer the example that especially where poverty is the issue, many organizations have been dealing with the stigma. And I noticed in the um, in the chat, someone mentioned stigma um, uh, and ways of, of outreaching to communities and dealing with this. And I, I will give you an example of where I, um, I, I experienced, again, this is a Safe Horizon example. Um, Safe Horizon uh, deals with victims of crime and abuse, including child abuse. And Safe Horizon in New York City, in each borough, runs what are called child advocacy centers, which are the official response, the official government response to the worst, the vic youngest victims of the most severe abuse. And in those centers are not only a human service organization, Safe Horizon, but also the special victim unit of the police, the police are there, prosecutors are there, contracts with hotel, um, um, hospitals where the doctors who are expert in child abuse are there. And, um, and it is a highly, and child protective services, highly, highly coordinated response, society's response to those who have been abused. Now, in Brooklyn, where there is a substantial Orthodox community, there's abuse in every community, but the community was not, um, I think that's a community that has particular challenging stigmas about reporting abuse, especially sexual abuse. A, a donor, and you talk about a relatively modest sum uh, in the neighborhood of $65,000. And I mean, I know that's not modest to everyone, but it's not like you needed a, a million dollars. Um, was able to enable Safe Horizon in Brooklyn to hire a Yiddish speaking social worker. And then those numbers went up dramatically. You couldn't recreate the Child Advocacy Center. There's only one, but you could dramatically increase the extent to which that particular community, our community, accepted and understood and partook of the services. And I think that that's something for, I would submit for the funding community to consider as well. It's, it's important to sort of put some of those pieces together. I, I love this part of the conversation because not only are there organizations that are in the same geographic area who people might be accessing, but, but that landscape isn't necessarily well known. And it's not 100% clear in a given landscape where whether a, a food pantry or whether a housing organization, whether an elder organization, whatever it is, is best served by a specifically Jewish nonprofit or whether a partnership is just a better leverage of resources. And so just asking that question is so important. Uh, there was another comment in the chat about, you know, JCCs who are supporting needs in the community that they had never supported before, you know, or not at this level really. Um, one of the one of the webinars we did earlier, and I think there's a, a link in the chat um, from Dina, who's the lead at JFN on this. Um, one of the webinars talked about Hillel's and how, particularly at commuter colleges, Hillel's were kind of one stop. Um, immediate safety net uh, type organizations, um, especially in commuter areas, which was not something that they had been dealing with before. Um, if I remember a particular quotation, if it was hunger, then it was someone whose parent, you know, forgot to send them their check that month, whereas now it really is much more sort of systemic family issues um, that they're seeing. So, and, and I know, Rachel, you know, you have a lot of interest in this area as well. What, can we just spend a moment on um, sort of that that balance between systemic solutions and safety net questions. In fact, we had two comments in the chat right after each other. One said, we focus on day-to-day, -day, not systemic solutions. And then the next one was, can we talk about a ladder up um, and not so much safety net? So maybe both of you can sort of address pieces of that and how to think, not either or, but how to think about the interplay between those. So I would say, um... It is very difficult and challenging to think how you can both help the individual at the individual level and make systemic change. And so in philanthropy and in nonprofit work, one of the questions is how do you do both of those at the same time well, so that your service delivery is excellent, but you're also looking towards meaningful sustained change, not just one summer of success, right? But 10 summers of success. Um, and for us, 
a major component of that has been through partnership and collaboration. It we do not do it alone, and we cannot often do it alone. Um, and our role in convening, our role in suggesting advancing an agenda, our role in cheering others at the table, feels like it is as important as whatever dollars Weinberg is putting behind something. So. In Baltimore, we found a problem with Summer Slide 10 years ago. We started with three other foundations, the Summer Funding Collaborative. It's now 13 partners, more than $3 million a year, one application, one evaluation, hundreds of organizations getting funding. It's a simple solution, but it's much more systemic than Weinberg funding 25 summer programs. So we can do both and do them well. It's a small example. But frankly, the National Jewish Poverty Convening Affinity Group, a very long name, um, led ably by Dina for so long now, uh, that is our effort to try to really bring together anyone representing an entity that is interested in this work, whether you are representing a foundation, whether you yourself are a philanthropist, whether you're at a nonprofit, whether you're at an association level, whether you are uh, in media, it doesn't matter. If you care about the agenda of poverty and are at the table, you can help inform decisions and suggestions and recommendations to advance the work. So that's been our answer, Susan, in trying to do both individual grants and then collaborative partnership, hard work, slow moving, but potentially more meaningful long-term change. You know, I reflected on this a lot because um, even even I, I started off by by saying that that we do both you know direct relief and then also longer term community growth and change, but even those are more direct than a third systemic approach, which is advocacy. So. You know, you can you can alleviate the misery of an individual. You can make a system work better, and then there's why are these the rules in the first place? And I used to um, agonize over the fact that my own gifts, such as they are, are in the area of service delivery. And was that really just? you know, not making enough of a difference. And you know what? I don't worry about that anymore. I think that it's all needed. When I entered upon this career, I thought, I think if I had asked myself, would I have made more difference of the world? Would I have made a difference in the world after 30 years? I think I would have thought I could have made more of a difference because these problems, poverty, I mean, A, read the Bible. B, you know, read um, in the science section excavations of pre-literate societies. There were always poorer people and richer people. This isn't something we're gonna make go away in a generation. So it takes all of us doing all of it to help. And I think direct alleviation is necessary systemic change is necessary, changing the rules which advocates work to do is necessary. And if there was ever a reason to say, lo alecha hamlacha ligmor, it's not your responsibility to finish it. And you know what? With humility, you have to recognize you can't even finish it. It's not that you aren't responsible. You have to have the humility to say, I can't do it myself. The loa taben chorim lehiva tell me mena, and none of us is free. And if everyone did their part in whatever way was meaningful to them, we would have a dramatically different world. So my position is do what interests you because it's all important and all needs to be done. Good. There's a comment in the chat, which I thought, comments and questions, which I thought was so interesting. Um, all poverty should be addressed, whatever religion, race, gender. In San Diego, probably like most of your communities, we're seeing 20% of Jewish households living in poverty or at the edge of poverty. Our texts prescribe charity as concentric circles, your immediate family first, other family next, then the community, then other neighbors. Yet in our community and maybe yours, our Jewish philanthropy receives a small percentage of Jewish giving. 
how have others addressed this? So I will definitely put that out to um, Ariel and Rachel. I'm also, if, if others in the chat have an answer to that, just such an important question, um, feel free to chime in. My, you know, I, I don't think I have a good answer for you on this one. I think this is part of the problem that Ariel just spoke to, and I, I don't want to repeat her elegant words, but, um, you know, again, whatever lane we are each in, we have an obligation to advance the work in that lane. And mm -hmm. hopefully working all together is better than working individually. Mm -hmm. um, Jacob Solomon, a few of us interviewed on a call last week. I think he's amazing. Uh, he's the CEO of the Federation in Miami. And we asked him a few questions about US Jewish poverty as part of this conversation. And he talked about a sociological reference from many generations ago about the importance of doing the solutions related to both private problems and public issues. And I asked him to give an example and forgive this one. It's great, but it's raw. You need to swap mosquitoes and you need to drain the swamp. No politics intended. You need to do the individual work and the systemic work. And um, San Diego is like most of the communities. That is accurate text. And you know, how have others addressed this? I think, again, there's, there's different models in different cities and we can learn from one another. And part of the purpose of the affinity group is God willing to do just that. Good, and maybe just to sort of take a, a spin on that one, one of the other things that we sort of have touched on a few times is just awareness building and how we are in a moment right now where wealth inequality, wealth inequity, um, and sort of this generation um, who is experiencing uh, poverty is experiencing COVID-related poverty, but also we know you know, communities of color are disproportionately being affected by poverty in particular. Um, but that whole notion that awareness building is, is on the front page of every newspaper now. Um, and I know one of the $64,000 questions in the community is, so when it's not on the front page of the paper is how do we kind of keep this idea alive? How do we keep the, the pressure on um, so that people don't, who are now visible, um, it was always there, but they're now more visible to the mainstream media and dialogue. How do we kind of keep that from, um, from dissipating as we, God willing, come out the other side of the recovery um, at the end of this year, um, potentially beginning of next year? As someone, I mean, going back to the, um, to the initial poll that, that we started this with, this is an unusual group because um, more than half of the people in this group are devoting more than half of their philanthropy to the poor. But um, we know that in the US, about 10% of charitable dollars actually support the poor. Uh, other charitable dollars go to universities and hospitals and museums. And, um, and, and, and so this is something that I've been struggling with, not just since COVID, but since forever, which is, um, how to uh, keep in the awareness of, of the public um, the plight of those who have the least. And I really think that storytelling is the key to it. The ability to, whether it's in the newspaper or in funder groups or in trade publications or whatever, um, decision makers read or consume, and I'm dating myself by saying read publications, because of course there's, of course, all of, all the other ways of consuming. It's it's telling the stories, but but not, um, you know. Have you ever heard the term poverty porn? That's where it's just you're wallowing in poverty and misery. It's. And, and, and by the way, it, it may stimulate some kinds of attention and giving, but really sustained giving also must honor the resiliency and the humanity of those who have less. And storytelling in that way, also focusing on the dignity of recipients, I actually think that's the way because people get fatigued, you know, um, I think about um, some images that that some charities um, use to raise funds. I, I look away from them. They're too upsetting. And, and I've been doing this work my whole life. I think the, the key is to is to find 
the images and stories that allow all the people who have more to feel a human connection to the to the people who have less and inspire their caring in that way. So I just will add on to that. Um, I don't know if you watch the Robin Hood Foundation in New York City and the work they do. It's been led for four years by Wes Moore, who we claim in Baltimore as ours. Uh, he's just announced he's stepping down. He's exploring a run for governor of Maryland. That's for another Zoom call. Um, but the, the work that the Weinberg Foundation, the Gates Foundation, Tipping Point, uh, and Robin Hood is doing together is what is called mobility labs. And the effort is to help people move out and stay out of poverty. And what are the interventions that are demonstrated that have results that are proven by Raj Chetty and others who are tracking this so that we can actually see change. The Robin Hood Foundation is very focused on what they call not storytelling, but narrative change in their language, which is just this. And if you go back to Harvard, Ariel's alma mater, their case study on the number one narrative change success since it's been tracked is stopping smoking, the smoking cessation campaign that it changed with narrative messaging, not statistics and data. And uh, COVID-19 work right now is studying narrative change and how to message regarding vaccine. And I think in the anti-poverty work in the Jewish community, part of what we need to do moving forward is think about the narrative change. So those messages are not the ones that, you know, you find pain and looking at and need to look away and you can um, understand and, and reinforce what's happening. And, and one example is the food issues on Hillel's um, in college campuses, which I know Rafi mentioned briefly in the chat, but we are finding a new Venn diagram of intersectionality with Jewish foundations focused on Jewish education in higher learning institutions, which as you know, Weinberg does not fund, but there is legitimate food insecurity and challenges of Jewish kids on college campuses, often community college campuses like the SUNY campuses in New York who do not have food during the day. And so there's this moment to try to think about how we can work together differently and articulate and tell that story as Ariel said differently. Okay, we've, had, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, we're coming up um, on the witching hour. Um, I do want to give both Ariel and Rachel a moment to give us the last word. Um, so let me ask my question. You can think about it. And then I'm gonna read out a couple more things in the chat because they're so interesting. Um, so here's my question to you two. So you're looking out at a virtual room of good-hearted funders who want to make a real difference. What is the highest and best use of philanthropy in a vast, complex, and dynamic set of systems that keep people in poverty? So highest and best use of philanthropy in a complex web of systems. So while you think about that, I just want to appreciate um, all of the ideas in the chat. There are some questions about good examples of awareness campaigns, challenges to awareness campaigns. There's a book mentioned. Um, there are definitely a number of links. So please do take the little, there are three little dots on the, on the right side of the chat. So if you want to click that, you will be able to download the chat onto your computer and, and take, take some of these uh, resources with you. Uh, but let me uh, give the floor back to you two. Um, Ariel, would you like to go first? Sure. Well, I think um, the highest and best use is whatever you as a donor can do most effectively and in a most sustained way. Um, that's what I would say. What can you really stick with? And mm -hmm. that's, that's what will allow you to make the biggest difference. Okay. Good. Rachel? I would say three things. The first thing I would say is use your voice you probably don't know that it's actually more powerful than you think. And how are you using that voice in whatever communities where you engage and you actually do have some power at your synagogue on the board, at your federation, at the nonprofit you're involved in, at the foundation you're involved in, uh, at your you know, community of gathering of friends, your family, whatever it might be, use your voice for this topic. The second is do not do it alone do it together with others who share your voice. Doesn't matter if that's nationally with us in this affinity group, although we'd love to have you in San Diego, put the 10 people together who care about it and move the chains forward. Um, and the final thing I would say, whatever lane you're swimming in, 
swim harder and do more. If you're in the media, do more stories on this topic. You know, it is not the sexy topic of the day and, and it should be an important story of the day. If you're a funder, if you're a philanthropist, if you're working at a nonprofit, figure out how to spend more of your time on this agenda and it will result in more happening. That would be my humble advice. Good. Well, uh, thanks to both of you. Thank all you right. all. Stay healthy. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.